thank you so much for listening to Haladin Music's podcast series on the Baroque era. My name is Sarah Joy, and today we will be talking about instrumental genres. Last episode, we talked about the vocal genres of the Baroque era, so cantatas, motets, oratorios, opera, but today we'll be discussing sonatas, concertos, suites, and a few keyboard genres. So this time period was roughly between 1600 and 1750. A few notable composers from that time, you have um, Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, and many others. Before we get started, I do want to let you know that Halladin Music created a beautiful Spotify playlist that includes all of the recordings that we've included so far in this series. So if you want to listen to the full versions instead of just the little clips that we play uh, in the actual podcast itself, you can go ahead and go find that playlist. Okay, so let's start out by talking about sonatas. Back then, whenever they used the term sonata to describe a certain type of composition, they didn't use it in the same way that we would use it today. Back then, sonata just meant that which is sounded, as opposed to what we talked about in the last episode, cantatas. Cantata means that which is sung. A Baroque sonata didn't have a certain number of movements. They weren't really arranged in any particular order. Basically, it just meant any and all kinds of instrumental works, including larger ensemble works where you have several players assigned to each individual um, instrumental part. There is a certain type of sonata that developed during this time called the trio sonata. This was when two voices were written above the basso continuo line. Oftentimes those two upper voices were written for violins. That's usually what the composers had in mind, but they were pretty easy going about swapping out instruments. So it didn't have to be two violins. It could be like two flutes, for example. Now these were mostly written for amateur musicians. So players that just wanted to create music for enjoyment with their friends. And that meant that these were often written with uh, a lower level of um, playing capabilities in mind. So they weren't super difficult to play. Now concertos, like sonatas, their definition changed over time. So back then, whenever a composer would use the term concerto, what they meant was technically in concert where you would have multiple musical lines working together. So for example, Bach actually titled a few of his cantatas concertos because you would have some soloists uh, alongside uh, a choir, alongside a string ensemble. So these multiple forces in concert working together. There were three categories of concertos. You had your concerto grosso, you had your solo concertos, and your ripieno concertos. Ripieno concertos were most like what I just described, where it was basically just a combination of forces. The other two, however, so solo concertos, you would have a single player single musician, or perhaps two, against the larger ensemble in the background. And that's closest to what we consider a concerto today, where you have a single soloist up front, and then you have the rest of the orchestra behind them, um, helping to support that main line. Um, the concerto grosso was where you would have a small group of soloists, so more than one or two soloists, and those would be featured against um, the larger ensemble in the back. But yeah, I think the piano concerto is probably the most confusing whenever you consider what concerto meant back then versus what we would consider concerto now. Back then, the piano concerto, you didn't even have a group of soloists up front. It was just multiple forces, um, not like a star up here and the supporting group back here. It was just a bunch of forces coming together as opposed to modern day, whenever we think concerto, that would be what the bro composers thought of as specifically solo concertos. I hope that that makes sense. One of our listening examples today is a great example of a Baroque concerto. This is Bach's harpsichord concerto in D minor. This recording does feature a piano rather than harpsichord, but nonetheless, it is very enjoyable to listen to, very beautiful. So let's take a listen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Next up, we have the suite. Suites are just a collection of dances, and probably the best example that I could give that most people are familiar with is uh, Bach's unaccompanied cello suites. And so we have another recording example for you. This is Bach's cello suite number one, the third movement, the courant. <laughs> structured type of suite was called the variation suite where you would take these dance movements and each one of them um, they would all be centered around a singular thematic musical idea. I've never tried to write anything like that myself but I can imagine as a composer it would be pretty fun. It'd be a challenge almost like a, like a game playing a game with composition. All right, next up, we have three keyboard genres. There are a lot of keyboard genres and I can't get to all of them, but I wanted to pick out the three that I think are probably most important. And the first one is the prelude. So the prelude is a great example of a free genre. Other free genres similar to this, uh, you have Fantasias, which Fantasia is I mean, basically almost interchangeable. That term is almost interchangeable with prelude. You have toccatas, um, but the prelude is just an example of a free genre. So uh, it's, if you as a listener weren't aware that a composer had actually written down these notes on a piece of paper, you might actually think that the performer was coming up with this out of the blue, that they were just sitting down and improvising because uh, preludes and other free genres. Um, they were free form, again, almost improvisational. They didn't have a fixed structure. I love listening to preludes. Um, they really take you on a journey and they're just, I love the, the free flow, the free flow of them. Next up, we have fugues. So let me see if I can explain a fugue decently. With a fugue, you have the subject that is stated first. So that's just a musical idea, right? And then while that subject is still being stated, you have a second voice enter in and it will state that subject again, um, but usually transposed up a fifth and it can have slight little changes to it. So it doesn't have to be the initial subject verbatim, but pretty much it is. Uh, now, once all of those, that second voice and other following voices have all entered and they've all stated the subject at least once all the way through, that is the end of what we call the exposition. So all of the subjects have been stated all the way through at least once, exposition is done. Then after that, you have what's called an episode. So that just uh, means an episode of whatever the composer wants to write. Doesn't really have to follow any rules per se. It's just um, some, some nice music in the middle. From there on out, uh, you alternate episodes with what are called middle entries, which are just um, new little places where imitation is again introduced. So episodes, middle entries, they keep alternating until the end where um, the subject, I think usually a shorter version of the subject, is restated at the end. And then uh, it usually just culminates and it builds up and it builds up um, into the end. Now, some fugues do include counter subjects, and a counter subject is basically a second theme that is, like the name implies, uh, contrapuntal to the main subject. And it kind of just comes in and out throughout the entire piece, kind of weaves its way throughout the whole thing. Next up, we have variations. Variations, um, it's when a melody is repeated over and over again, but each time it comes back, each time you hear it, there's going to be a slight change to it from the time before. So the alterations could be um, a change in rhythm, perhaps a change in instrumentation, um, 
an added contrapuntal line to it. Um, maybe a few added notes here and there. And I think probably a basic example of this, I don't know how many of you listening are string players by any chance, um, but if you are, there's a possibility that you grew up with the Suzuki method. And one of the first pieces you learn in the Suzuki method as a string player uh, are the twinkle twinkle variations where you take the melody twinkle twinkle little star. And I think you maybe play it six times. I can't remember the, the number, but each time it's a different rhythm or a different bow stroke, a different bow technique. And uh, yeah, it's great for beginner musicians because they already have the melody in their ear, but you know, in that way they can just focus on whatever new technique or new rhythm is being introduced to them. A great example of this is Box Goldberg variations. Take a listen to that. I think that's a great, a great one. Um, an example that I'm going to play for you today is Chacon in F minor, and this is attributed to Pachelbel. It was written for the organ, but the recording today is performed on piano. So a chaconne is a type of variation, but it's very, very strict, and it's built on what is called an obstinate bass. The reason why it's called an obstinate bass is because it doesn't go anywhere throughout the entire piece. This short, simple, repeating bass line is always present. So the composer would have to get pretty, pretty darn creative and create interesting uh, counter melodies on top of it to hold the listener's interest. This particular example is very beautiful and hopefully um, hopefully it's not a confusing example. This is just played, again we're under the heading of keyboard genres, this is just played by a piano um, and so it's not like you can just pick out the bass instrument and hear the bass line easily but what you can do is when you're listening to this recording, pay attention to the lowest note that's being played by the piano and your ear will start to pick out the moving bass line. It is quite slow in this recording, so keep that in mind. It's gonna go very slowly, note by note, uh, descending in a descending pattern like this. And uh, yeah, but keep that in mind while you listen and you will be able to pick out that obstinate bass. All right, let's take a listen. All right, that's all that we have for today. I hope that you are enjoying the series so far. Thank you for listening.